Hello and welcome. This VPAL signature event is brought to you by Harvard's Office of the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We'll be talking with professors Francesca Gino and Julia Minson about how to engage in productive disagreements. When faced with conflict, humans often fight or flee. But Julia Minson and Francesca Gino tell us there's a better strategy to engage in the disagreement with an open mind and ready to learn. Drawing on Julia's research on receptiveness to opposing views and their joint work on the language we need to use to show others we are listening, Julia and Francesca will talk about how to disagree more productively. Francesca Gino is an award-winning researcher who focuses on why people make the decisions they do at work and how leaders and employees have more productive, creative, and fulfilling lives. She is the Tandon Family Professor of Business Administration in the Negotiation, Organizations, and Markets Unit at Harvard Business School and the author most recently of Rebel Talent, Why It Pays to Break the Rules in Work and Life. For a more extensive bio, please visit francescagino.com. Julia Minson is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She is a decision scientist with research interests in conflict, negotiations, and judgment in decision making. Her primary line of research addresses the psychology of disagreement. How do people engage with opinions, judgments, and decisions that are different from their own? For a more extensive bio, please visit juliaminson.com. This afternoon, Francesca and Julia will discuss how to engage in productive disagreement. Francesca and Julia, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. Very much looking forward to the type of questions that you're going to be asking about this topic that is very dear to us. I remember as we started working together on the topic, I kept bringing to Julia the observations that every time I was saying that I would be speaking about how to engage in productive disagreements, a lot of the reaction was as if this was possible. And so to get us started, we want to take you inside of an organization's where leaders and employees have been thinking a lot about the value of disagreements. I think that many of us look at conflicts as something that we rather avoid rather than engage with, with confidence. And as part of the working of this particular organization, there is an understanding that conflict and disagreements can in fact be quite beneficial to the work that they do. The organization is Pixar Animation Studios. No matter where you're at in the world, I think that we're all familiar with the work that they do. They create quite innovative films that have been incredibly successful. One of the things that often we might not realize is this are very intensive projects that often span three, four, sometimes even five years. And along the way, directors, even the very experienced one, get stuck on the working of a film. And so they instituted some practices that allow for them to discuss ideas in a very particular way, such that we hear different perspective on how to improve on that film. So we'll share with you a clip in particular that comes from a, a case study that we did on Pixar. And you're gonna hear in particular from one of a Pixar co-founder, his name is Ed Catmull, and he's reflecting on his experience of participating and attending brainstorming sessions. So the sessions that they organize, they call them the brain trust, whenever a director gets stuck. So let's hear his perspective. When we made Toy Story, what we found uh, was that the four people responsible for creating the film had this real incredible relationship with each other. It could be very intense, but it was very focused and it was on the problem. When I happened to be in some of those meetings, I was in awe of both the intensity and the focus. And I've always loved it when the intensity is on the problem. And this whole thing was never like people disagreeing about something and it was personal. It was intense disagreement and they would come out and say, wow, that was wonderful. We had a great discussion. Like that's like when you see that, that's, that's really good. Um, so as we, as we started to develop to try to get a, a sustainable culture, uh, we had more films coming along. Some other people then became part of that group trying to solve these story problems. 
And uh, Andrew Stanton, who was one of the, the four, um, re referred to them as the brain trust. And as we grew, other people came to it. And it was an interesting process just to watch how the group matured and what worked and what didn't work as we added people to it. Now, what I think was most interesting about this inside view of Pixar, what really stood out to Julia and myself is the fact that you hear them talk about this very intense disagreements and then people coming out of the room and saying that was an amazing discussion. That didn't seem to be descriptive of the experience that we often have when we are part of professional disagreements, disagreements at work, or even disagreements in our personal life where the experience is you go into it and yes, you challenge each other's, you're in conflict and you come out feeling bruised. And so what is it that they were able to figure out that allowed for these agreements to be productive? And more importantly, what it is that we can all embrace and do differently such that these agreements, in fact, turn out to be productive rather than damaging. And so Julia is going to walk us through some of the research that we've done together and some of the research that she has done trying to tackle this very question. Julia, I'm going to pass the torch to you. All right. Thanks, Fran. Um, yeah. So, you know, just as uh, Francesca pointed out, the experience that we saw at Pixar is just not what happens most of the time for most people. But I always had this feeling that like some people are different, right? Some people are better at this than others. Um, you know, I, I can think of co-authors that go very quickly from disagreeing to yelling. And then I can think of other co-authors who are like, huh, that's really interesting. Like, tell me more about that. Um, and so for, uh, you know, so since very early in my career, I was interested in what is really the difference in the psychology of those uh, sort of two sorts of people. Um, and so uh, a former classmate of mine, uh, Francis Chen, uh, and I started this work back at Stanford when we were graduate students trying to understand what is receptiveness to opposing views, right? What is it that some people have that makes them really willing to thoughtfully engage with opposing perspectives? And so in the long run, we describe receptiveness as the willingness to access, consider, and evaluate supporting and opposing views in a relatively impartial manner. It's kind of a mouthful of a definition, but it's worth sitting with it for a second because what it really means is in order to think thoroughly about a new idea, first you have to access it, right? First you have to be in the room with the TV on where somebody is saying something you disagree with, or you have to pick up the newspaper or you have to read a blog post. The information has to somehow like get inside of your head, right? And so sometimes people say, okay, well, I've listened to it and now I'm done because I think it's stupid. That's not receptiveness. We need sort of the second step, which is we need to think hard about it. We need to think about kind of the merits of the new ideas and think about them sort of at the same length and to the same depth as ideas from our own side of the table. And that's still not enough because sometimes people access information and think about it hard only to find holes in it. Right, so I've already made up my mind that this information is sort of false and irrelevant and misleading, and I'm only thinking hard about it like an attorney would in order to find the flaws in the argument. So we really think of receptiveness as treating information from your side and from the opposing side uh, in a more similar way when you access it, when you think about how much time to give it in your head, and then how you evaluate it at the end of that process. Love yeah. the fact that this really poses almost a third options that we don't see in the face of conflicts, since I am going to raise my hand and say that often in light of a disagreement, I either avoid it or come in with the thinking, I'm going to show you how right I am and wrong you are. And this is a very different approach. Well, right. And one of the things notice, Fran, that is not in the definition, like the part that's not in the definition is perhaps the most important part of the definition, which is there is nothing in here about persuading the other person. And there's nothing in here about being persuaded by the other person. Right. So at the end of the day, a person who is very receptive can say, well, look, I listened to your point. I thought about it hard. I think your arguments are you know, reasonable. 
but I just disagree and I will continue to disagree because my arguments are better or I have more of them, right? Or they're sort of more relevant to me. So receptiveness doesn't mean that I am persuadable. It doesn't mean that I'm going to compromise and change my mind. It simply means that I'm going to think hard about what you have to say. Um, now, this is all sort of very conceptual, right? How do we know uh, who's got how much of this thing? Um, so we developed a scale um, and uh, the scale looks roughly like this. So there's 18 items and they all have this format sort of agree to disagree uh, on a seven point scale. It takes about five minutes to take. Uh, and then we realized that, you know, a lot of people don't read academic journals. So we made a website because that's how you get people to engage with things. So you can go to this website. It's called receptiveness.net. Um, and if you so choose, but not right now in the middle of our talk, uh, you can go and click on this button and actually take the receptiveness scale and find out how receptive you are. Um, and one of the things that you will see is you will see your own score and you will see how it compares to other people who might be, you know, your age or your gender or your political affiliation uh, to give you like a little bit of a sense of where you fall in this general distribution. So we have a scale. Uh, we know conceptually what it measures. Uh, how are these people different in terms of their behavior? Well, so in you know, many, many follow-up studies, we started trying to understand how do receptive people process information differently, right? Do they really do those things that we imagine? Um, and it turns out that they do. So people who are more receptive actually expose themselves to more balanced information. So for example, in studies, when we say, you know, pick which websites you would like to read about, uh, people overwhelmingly pick information from their own side, right? So Democrats want to read more Democratic arguments, Republicans want to read more Republican arguments. And you can think of it as, you know, as an economist, that's kind of irrational because you already know the arguments on your side. So, you know, like, why are you spending your time reading more stuff you know? Um, we know that people who are more receptive are better at maintaining attention to content they disagree with. So if I make you watch a political speech, if it's from the opposite side, you're just going to tune out. But people who are more receptive tune out less. Um, they evaluate arguments in a more fair-minded manner. And interestingly, people around them sort of get that this is a benefit. So we know that people who are more receptive are more desirable colleagues uh, people want to be friends with them. People think they have better judgment. You know, people think that they want to take their advice. So receptiveness seems like a really, really good thing. Where we run into trouble, though, is how to make people more receptive, because that seems to be a difficult, difficult thing. So Fran, yeah. what have you heard in your work about what, why is this so hard? <laughs> what have you seen? <laughs> Uh, first, I want to say why it's so important, especially in the moment we are living through today. I, like you, often find myself as part of conversations where what I hear a lot of people struggling with in their work and also in their friendships, in their networks, is having hard conversations, being able, based on different views and beliefs, to truly engage with somebody who thinks differently. And so I can think of issues like vaccines, no vaccines, hybrid work or remote work, no hybrid, no remote. It feels like we are so easily divided in all sorts of issues and often choose not to engage with somebody who thinks differently. And so I love the fact that uh, part of the why, <laughs> what gets in the way, it's how hard it is when you're so strongly sure that your belief, that your values, that your perspective is the right one. What else would you mention? One is hard and it's uncomfortable to recognize that there is a different viewpoint. What else would you add? Well, I think you're right. I think it has changed, right? I mean, anybody who is like, you know, past 15 uh, agrees that things feel worse than they did a little while ago, right? These conversations have become more accusatory, more emotional. Um, and, you know, my, my theory is that it's become so much easier to surround yourself with people who agree. 
So, mm-hmm. you know, it's always been easier to talk to people we agree with than people we disagree with, but you used to not have a choice. You used to, you know, live in a town and you live with whoever you live. And if they disagree with you, you still have to talk to them. Uh, now you can go online and create your own little universe of people who think just like you. Uh, and together you sort of proceed to demonize the people who think differently. And it makes it that much harder to then exercise that muscle of engagement with opposing perspectives when you don't do it for you know weeks or months on end. So I think that's I think that's part of it. Um, I think another part of it is that people are really afraid that by being receptive, they're going to give ground. Mm -hmm. They're going to sort of give a platform to something they really hate, or people are going to think that they agree, uh, or they're going to somehow shift the conversation in sort of this undesirable way. Like there's this real conflation of receptiveness and agreement. Absolutely. But we've also seen situations in our own research as well as in organizations like Pixar or in other organizations like the non-for-profit Braver Angels, where even in situations where people really have different beliefs, in that case, it would be political beliefs, you can come together and actually talk through your different views in a way that allows for some learning. I think that those type of cases can be inspiring because they allow us to see that that is possible. Often people leave those workshops feeling that they're not as divided as they're brought to believe. So I wonder, let's explore what it is that we can all do. Let's not disclose whether we are by default more or less the receptive, but uh, (laughs) what it is that we know about language that we can use to become more receptive? Yeah, so I think, you know, you're kind of pointing us in the direction of a lot of the research we've done together for the last few years. Uh, And that research really came from a question that I had when we developed the scale, how how does receptiveness impact conflict, right? If I'm very receptive, uh, can you tell that I'm being very receptive? And are you going to give me credit for being receptive, right? People told us that they want to work with receptive counterparts, but can they actually tell the difference? Um, And so we ran a study uh, as part of uh, what I was teaching at uh, in the Kennedy School Executive Education Program a few years ago, um, where we asked participants in this executive education class uh, to fill out uh, the questionnaire about receptiveness, right? Tell us how receptive they are. And then we asked them their attitudes on a bunch of like super controversial topics, right? So this was, you know, the early days of the Black Lives Matter movement, marijuana legalization, the death penalty, like really the hot stuff. Um, and then on the second day, we took these folks and we paired them up with somebody else in the class with whom they strongly disagreed on one of these hot button topics. And we put them in a chat room with that person and asked them to talk about the issue. Now, the thing that was really important is that they were anonymous, right? So they didn't know who they were talking to. They knew it was somebody else in the class, but they had sort of the ability to be honest about their perspectives because they didn't know who their counterpart was. And at the end of the conversation, we said, well, how receptive were you in this conversation? Like setting aside how receptive you think you are in life in general, how receptive were you right now? And how receptive was your partner? And by the way, do you ever want to work with this person again, right? And so what we saw was something, you know, kind of interesting and hopeful, which is that the more receptive people saw their partner as being, the more they wanted to work with them. And so this was, you know, a very strong relationship. I mean, you can kind of squint at it and see that it's there. You don't have to, you know, run statistical analyses. But at the same time, it actually raised two very confusing questions. One, when people said their partner is more receptive, we had no idea what they meant by that, right? Like, what are they actually reacting to? And secondly, what we found was that how receptive people said they were was almost entirely unrelated with how receptive their partner said they were. So whatever it is that's happening in my head that's making me feel like I'm being very receptive turns out is quite different than what my counterparts see. 
And so this was, you know, this was a real mystery that uh, led us to have some very uh, confusing and complicated conversations. Um, but uh, thank goodness for technology. Uh, this problem was solved uh, when we uh, started collaborating with uh, Mike Yeomans, who was a postdoc at Harvard at the time and is now a professor at the Imperial College of London. Um, and together with Mike, we developed a natural language processing algorithm that basically figured out what it is that people are reacting to when they say somebody is receptive. Um, and the way you do this kind of work uh, is, you know, really interesting and kind of applies to a lot of different uh, communication strategies that you can use, not just receptiveness. Basically, what you do is you collect hundreds of conversations between people who disagree on some important topic. And then you get a new group of people and you say, OK, can you read these transcripts? and rate how receptive and open-minded the people in that conversation were. And then you write a machine learning algorithm, which for the non-technical people out there in Zoom world is basically just a giant regression. And so you say, okay, what are the words and the phrases that are correlated with people's ratings of receptiveness? In other words, when somebody said this person was really receptive, what did they actually say? Okay, so again, all sounds very abstract. So we're going to play a game. This is my favorite nerdy game. It's called pretend you're an algorithm. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you two pieces of text. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to vote which one of them is more receptive and which one of them is less receptive. Okay, so if you think the first piece of text is more receptive, you put a one in the chat. And if you think the second piece of text is more receptive, you put a two in the chat, okay? And you have to play to get the prize. So here we go. We have one and we have two. I understand what you're saying. There probably is some truth to the fact that these issues have been hidden for a long time. However, coming from St. Louis and witnesses the Ferguson riots, I can also see how things can be blown out of proportion and make people feel that it's worse than it is. I agree real problem exists, but possibly sometimes attention is drawn in the wrong places. And the second one is overreacting to police confrontations can be deadly to the public in general. When animosity towards the police rises, as it has in Chicago, police do not feel safe going into the ghetto neighborhoods. Therefore, those people in those neighborhoods literally have to fend for themselves because if they need the police and call for their help, the police can't help those in need there because they will likely be shot at themselves. And then vote in the chat. And I think that the chat is pretty remarkable. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I, this is the first time I have ever done this exercise where we've had a hundred percent consensus. Usually it's like between 80 and 90, right? Usually people are like, yeah, the first one is definitely more receptive. This is the first time everybody agrees that it's the first one. And the thing that's interesting that yeah, I should have pointed out earlier on is that uh, these people who wrote these two messages share the same point of view mm -hmm. and they're responding to the same prompt. And so you see how you can express the same thing or sort of roughly the same thing uh, at the same level of disagreement, but in very different words. And so what happens then is we can use the algorithm, right, to figure out like, okay, well, we all agree that the first one is more receptive. And one of the things I'm starting to see in the chat is people are starting to like pick out what are the words, right? Like, what is the magic sauce? What is the thing that makes the first one seem better, right? Um, that's exactly what the algorithm does. So the algorithm uh, produces a figure that looks like this. And so what you see on the y-axis here is a bunch of parts of speech, right? So these are sort of the types of things a person might say. And then what it gives us is the frequency of these types of speech in messages that are seen as more unreceptive by human raters versus more receptive by human raters. So for example, if you think of the negation, right? Negation is words like no, don't, can't, won't. So there's more negations in unreceptive speech than in receptive speech. 
Reasoning is one of my personal favorites. Reasoning is what academics do all the time. It's words like because and therefore and however and although. Uh, they make us sound so, so smart, uh, but at the same time, uh, it also sounds a little bit condescending. By contrast, uh, one of the most receptive things you can do is this thing over here called acknowledgement, right? So acknowledgement is basically using some of your own airtime to restate the other person's position. So instead of launching into a full-throated defense of your perspective, you say, okay, so I understand that you are saying blah, blah, blah. Or it sounds to me like what's really important to you is X, Y, Z. So I'm donating a little bit of my own time in order to show you that I have truly heard you. Mm -hmm. um, some other things that uh, I think jump out at me a lot in this is uh, agreement. Agreement is a funny one because uh, remember we talked about how receptiveness does not mean agreement. Uh, I stand by that. Receptiveness does not mean agreement. Uh, what it means in this case is that you can find some areas of agreement even in the midst of disagreement. So for example, we could be disagreeing about whether schools uh, should be closed during a COVID surge or whether they should reopen. And I might say, we both agree that we want our children to be safe and get an excellent education, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not giving up on whatever my perspective on that issue is, but I'm finding kind of a higher level uh, of abstraction and sort of a set of values that we can both share. Um, I also okay. find yeah. that, uh, the idea of positive emotions to be important. Again, mm -hmm. maybe it's intuitive, but especially in the context of these agreements, it's so easy to go into the negative. And so remembering mm -hmm. uh, that there is an opportunity there, especially when we think about embracing these ideas in the way we talk to each other in disagreement. That's right. That's right. That's right. So if we go back to our example, it turns out that the two texts that we were looking at differ on these five very specific features. Um, and so we can look at them again. And so now you see the first one with sort of the words highlighted that the algorithm would pick out. Uh, so I understand uh, is uh, acknowledgement, probably is a hedge. I can also see is agreement. I agree as agreement, but probably sometimes is a hedge. Right. Whereas the other one, by contrast, do not and can't are negations and therefore because and because are reasoning words. So you see almost sort of no overlap in the uh, in the type of language that's being used. Um, so, you know, this toolkit uh, has really been uh added a very powerful, I would say, impetus to our research and uh, our teaching and uh, consulting practices. Because what we found over time uh, is that these words strongly predict conflict outcomes. So we can use the algorithm to analyze existing data, uh, you know, sort of large data sets of language and see that when people use conversational receptiveness, uh, the conversation is less likely to de-escalate into conflict. And we've seen this across a variety of sort of very, very different domains. Um, we know that the algorithm has really high consensus with human raters, right? So when humans read the same text, they're like, oh yeah, definitely. Like that, that sounds better. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly what you guys did. Um, and we know that uh, because again, this mix of algorithmic and human components to it, we can analyze large bodies of text and really sort of help, uh, you know, entire organizations do better at this by looking at, uh, you know, and how people talk. What I find most interesting from our work, and yes, I know it's self-serving because we are behind the research, but is that the very features that the algorithm suggested are features that we're now using to almost train that receptiveness muscle to try to use language in our disagreements as such that we turn them into more productive conversation. And even when the other side 
seems to be combative or difficult or not receptive. What we know from some of our recent work is that our approach can be contagious. And so I love the fact that it's on us to get started. So Julia, I'm wondering whether we can cover before we go to questions, whether we can cover our I hear framework as a way to <laughs> leave people with a good framework to work with in their own disagreements. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, so the algorithm puts out a list of 38 words and phrases, which is obviously too much for people to just remember. Uh, and so what we did in trying to make this a little bit more digestible and practical for people is that we uh, created an acronym. An acronym is HEAR, as in I hear you, right? And so the way HEAR works is this. So the H stands for hedging. Um, and it's phrases like, I think it's possible that, or this might happen because, or some people tend to think. Uh, the E stands for emphasizing agreement. So I think we both want to, or I agree with some of what you're saying, or we are both concerned with. The A stands for acknowledging other perspectives. Uh, so phrases like, I understand that, I see your point or what I think you're saying is. Uh, and then the R is this point Francesca was making a little while ago about reframing to the positive. So you can say exactly the same thing, but using positive terms instead of negative terms, right? I think it's great when people don't interrupt me or I really appreciate it when you do the dishes. Uh, it would be so wonderful if, right, fill in the blank. Um, and so, you know, I really want to also kind of highlight the point that Fran made a couple minutes ago, uh, because it really speaks to one of the questions in the chat. Uh, receptiveness seems to affect the person you're talking to. So what we've seen in our recent studies is that if we teach one side to be receptive, the other side naturally mimics it. Uh, you know, you could imagine, for example, that if I'm very receptive, my counterpart says, aha, she doesn't have a strong opinion. I'm going to sort of jump all over this person and be as persuasive as I possibly can. But what we're actually finding is the opposite, is that it sort of elevates the entire tone of the conversation. Um, and to me, it's just a really kind of delightful idea that in order to get people to really listen to me, what I need to do is listen to them. Yep. And what I also love is that it takes you away from the usual, okay, I see the potential for disagreement, I want to jump in, and you really have this mindset of, I'm truly going to show you how right I am. It's very difficult to have that posture, if you will, once you're embracing this type of framework, because it lowers the emotions and gives you the opportunity to learn from each other to the extent that that is possible. We also found worth noting that if your intent is to persuade the other side to start with, this is more of a productive approach rather than, and more effective approach rather than going in wanting to persuade. All right, well, I see many, many questions in the Q&A. Um, and so maybe we should uh, grab some from there. We've been kind of answering some of them uh, as we go, uh, but I think it's, uh, I think it's a... I'll throw one at you, Julia, since yeah. I feel like this is a question that we receive a lot. What uh -huh. do you do when you're dealing with a person that doesn't have honest arguments on the other side, might believe in fake views, uh, they're being arrogant, aggressive. I think that a lot of the questions are about working with a person who doesn't seem to be from the very start receptive at all. Thanks for giving me the easy question to start with. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, there's there's a lot baked in there. One of the things that I think is baked in there is we often start disagreements with assumptions about the other side, right? So if it's something that I don't believe or I don't agree with, I say, well, nobody could possibly believe that. So they're not approaching this question in good faith, right? They are posturing, they're trying to get something for themselves. They can't possibly take that argument seriously. And so there's sort of this, you know, we go in 
with this set of assumptions and stereotypes about people who we disagree with. Uh, and, you know, those may be accurate, those may be not accurate, but the only way to find out is to ask a lot of questions, right? Yeah. Um, so I think one is sort of like, leave the assumption that you actually understand your counterpart on the other side of the door, because most of the time, even people that we know really well and people who we love dearly, we don't actually know what's happening in their heads. Yeah, uh, I think we've both seen that in our marriages. <laughs> Absolutely. And when you look at very extreme cases where you might think that assumptions are warranted, I'm thinking about the learning from an hostage negotiators that I followed and took classes from during the pandemic. It might be easy if you see a person on the bridge about to jump or a person with a gun uh, pointed to the head of another person to make assumptions about are they rational? Are they okay? And that doesn't even get questions or thought about, but you go in wanting to discover and wanting to learn. And so I think that part of what this approach allows us to do is bringing curiosity, which is a dimension of receptiveness rather than going to assumptions too quickly. Yeah, and I think, I think I'm glad you bring up that point about extreme cases because I often get this question of, well, you know, if you're negotiating with Vladimir Putin, this would never work. Well, probably not, but 99.9% .9 of your difficult conversations are not actually with Vladimir Putin, right? They're with your spouse, they're with your team members at your job, they are with your, you know, difficult relatives over Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, most people in the world, sort of almost by definition of what it means to be most people are not those extreme cases that we think about as people we absolutely cannot uh, sort of tolerate and condone. Uh, and so I think one mistake is to paint everybody on the opposite side of some disagreement with that same brush of, you know, if they support X, Y, Z, then they completely 100% share that person's beliefs and convictions and ideology. Absolutely. There is also a question of what is meant by the term productive in the phrase productive disagreements. Yeah. Uh, but that's a really interesting question to be asking. I, you know, I think it's really interesting, right? And so one of the one of the papers that we have recently uh, published with uh, our st our students, uh, Hannah Collins and Charlie Dorison, is the goals that people have in disagreement. And I think it's a very valid question to ask because most of the time we go into disagreements without a goal. And the goal sort of emerges organically as we start arguing with people and the goal, you know, becomes to win. Um, so it turns out that if you ask people what their goals are, um, it's, you know, they list essentially two categories. They list uh, the goal of proving the other person that they're wrong and, you know, proving them that they're right. Uh, and another goal they list is learning about the other person's perspective. Uh, and those are kind of the two categories. And the other thing we sort of learned was that people really uh, give themselves a lot of credit for being willing to learn and having that goal and pursuing it. And at the same time, thinking that their counterpart doesn't want to learn. Um, and, you know, and in that work, what we've shown is that people have more positive interactions and are more willing to talk to each other again and think better of each other if they believe that the other person wants to learn. So, you know, you can think of a lot of those things as uh, cues of productivity. I do think that we jump to the conclusion that the goal is persuasion uh, entirely too quickly. There is also a question of, I'll read it out uh, for us. I believe I'm understanding correctly that these analyses are based solely on written language with no visual or audio clues or body language. Is that correct? If so, doesn't that approach miss out on a lot of valuable information that shapes people's perceptions of another's receptiveness? Yes, and yes. <laughs> No, so so in, in all seriousness, uh, so the analysis is based on written text. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's the case for sort of both practical and important theoretical reasons. So on the practical side, uh, language is like infinitely dimensional uh, on its own. Once you add body language, 
uh, it becomes a very, very difficult technical and computational problem. Uh, a lot of our communication is now text-based, right? So people text, people have, you know, Slack, people have entire relationships with people whose faces they've never seen. Uh, but I think on a theoretical level, it would be very strange if people used receptive body language with unreceptive language or vice versa. Right, that kind of divergence in different aspects of your own behavior would be really hard to enact. Um, so I suspect that if we solve the technological problems and we're able to measure people's body language, the results would be very, very similar, but perhaps harder to train, right? Because we can teach people to use specific words, it's harder to teach them to enact specific body language in just the right way. I am seeing, I'm reading through the questions and I love them uh, all. Uh, a lot of them come to, from the standpoint of, I tried being receptive, but somehow the other side didn't move, or I tried uh -huh. being receptive and the other side was belligerent or arrogant or made statements that were truly inappropriate. I think I go back to some of the advice that, that we have wrote about in our joint Harvard Business Review piece where we talk about it's important for us to start being receptive. You're going to have the likelihood of being contagious and find that the other side to start responding with the same type of receptiveness. But it's also possible that, in fact, you're in a conversation where the other person is not changing their view or is not showing any willingness to engage. And so there might be, in fact, situations where you reach the conclusion that this is uh, a disagreement that you don't want to be part of. Any other ideas that, that you want to share with people who are asking questions along those lines? No, I mean, I think I think that's true. And I, th I think there's two pieces to it, right? One goes back to this question of what do we call productive and what the goal really is, right? So if the goal is to understand where the other person is coming from, then you don't need them to budge and you don't need them to change their mind, right? Understanding is something that you can accomplish with like minimum cooperation from them because most people like to talk about themselves. So if you ask questions, they will usually answer them. Um, there's another piece to this, which is I'm always surprised by how much patience this takes mm -hmm. and how hard this is to execute when you're actually angry or frustrated or tired. Um, you know, I mean, obviously we know this research inside and out because we wrote it, uh, but I can think of several examples in my life where I, I was upset with somebody and I had to ask a colleague to tell me how to use receptiveness in this situation. <laughs> I'm right here with you. Said, it's, yeah, it's your We're research. Long. What are you talking That's about? Exactly right. And yeah. I love the fact that it's good to think of it as a muscle that we need to keep practicing. I sometimes, even in conversation with my own uh, significant half, who I dearly love, we sometimes get into conflicts where our beliefs are truly different. And he might point out, don't you study receptiveness? And so uh, <laughs> it's a recognition that you might not be in the right emotional space or have the energy to use these features of language. We're also getting a really interesting questions about gender differences. Mm. And there I think we have some exciting uh, results to share since what we see is that more women more so than men are uh, more naturally able to use language that is receptive. Yeah so it's, it's a really interesting wrinkle to it right so because we have the algorithm and we can analyze large amounts of data we can sort of slice it and dice it by you know lots of different ways and so what we have found is that when people are, you know, completely untrained and are just sort of doing whatever they naturally do, women tend to use more conversational receptiveness, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's interesting because, you know, there's, I mean, obviously some nice implications to that, uh, you know, both in terms of how you're going to sort of train people and who you're going to put in positions that are, you know, that really require this skill set. Um, the gender difference there is actually quite, quite large. 
Julia, I want to ask a final question that seems to get a lot of thumbs up uh, in the Q&A. What about colleagues, peers criticizing you for being receptive? I'm getting this a lot in my Harvard discussion classes for trying to consider other sides. What would you say to that? You know, so it's something that people worry about a lot. Mm -hmm. I also get it a lot in my in my classes. Uh, and I have just never seen the evidence to support it. Uh, and in fact, what I've seen is a lot of the evidence in the opposite, in the opposite direction. So uh, Kristen Lauren is a researcher at the University of British Columbia, um, and she uh, published a really nice paper a couple of years ago that basically showed that, let's say you're a Democrat and you are being receptive to a Republican, will other Democrats judge you negatively? Turns out that's not the case. People appreciate receptiveness even receptiveness from your own in-group member to an out-group member. And I think the key, again, is that distinction between receptiveness and changing your mind, right? So if you compromise and switch sides, nobody's going to like that, right? But if you say, look, I disagree with you on this, and I think this is why I disagree, but help me understand why you believe what you believe, because I would like to really, you know, think hard about your point of view, that is very, very hard to judge negatively. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think that that is a remarkably interesting question to end on. I'm just going to end with a big thank you to everyone who participated, but also with a reminder that these are topics that are dear to our hearts. I think they're very important, especially thinking about the society that we're in and the organizations we operate in at the moment and how easy it is to feel divided. And so for people who want to learn more, who have more questions, please do reach out to us since a lot of the questions that we're asking, that you're asking are questions that we're doing research on. Any final words for you from you, uh, Julia? No, this was so interesting and so fun. And I love the questions. Uh, and we're always, uh, I think, very happy to engage with uh, thoughtful questions in our email. So you all know how to find us. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, joining Fran and uh, being such a great research partner and great uh, partner for this, for this talk. Same here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Francesca and Julia. Your presentation and conversation were very interesting and helpful. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining.